fin intro and then I'm going to hand it over to Gorin to do another little, you know, welcome thing. Actually, no, why don't I just say this is part two and we just don't have to worry about that. Mm. So I'll just do a quick intro um, and then we can, um, I'll hand it over directly to you, Mary. Mary, you can introduce DK. Great. Does that sound really good? Okay, all right. Lauren, would you like to begin recording? Yeah, I just started rolling about five seconds ago, so we'll just edit oh. this out. <laughs> We're already rolling. Yes, please. We don't need to have the bloopers. I would appreciate that. <laughs> okay, all right. Hello and welcome back everyone to part two of our very special idea jam with the Canadian Network for Imagination and Creativity, celebrating the World Creativity and Innovation Week Day. And uh, we're very, very excited to be heading into our second part. And Mary Blatherwick, uh, one of our steering committee members, will introduce our next guest. Hmm. Thank you, Alexis. Um, this is really an exciting evening. It was just fantastic hearing the first session with uh, Jackie and Duane and uh, and the incredible emphasis on storytelling and uh, and meaning. And I think that that's a wonderful sort of segue into the second uh, person who's speaking tonight. Um, I'm our, our special guest uh, here is uh, DK from uh, New Zealand, and I just have a little bit to read about him. He sent me a little passage here. Um, DK uh, is a, actually is a creative producer. Producer. And I met DK, I was in New Zealand a few years ago. Uh, he had he runs incredible conferences, uh, world class conferences on creative leadership. And uh, he's a creative producer who crafts delicious learning experiences online, in studio or in person. He spent nearly a decade as a, uh, uh, a TEDx uh, Will uh, Wellington and TEDx Wellington woman uh, licensee plus founder of the unique video podcast Creative Welly and the annual Creative Leadership New Zealand Conferences, which is the one that I was so fortunate to attend. Um, he's also a speaker coach working with CEOs and senior executives plus a random ex all black and dame uh, thrown into the mix, plus delivers internal masterclasses on topics of purposeful storytelling to leadership groups around the world. He has spoken on five continents to audiences large and small, and is driven to enable people to find and have a voice. So I think, again, he's a great person to follow what we've just experienced uh, so beautifully and wonderfully uh, in our first uh idea jam tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to, to DK um, this evening and uh, let him take us through um, a journey of his own and uh, to uh, share his understandings of this topic. Thank you so much. DK. Oh, thank you everybody for your attention and time. Thank you for Mary and everybody behind the scenes for making this happen. I'm from Wales, although I live in New Zealand, if you were trying to guess my accent. So I always <laughs> get that out of the way because people are like, is he Irish? Is he Scottish? I'm Welsh, where Tom Jones is from, or if you're younger, Catherine Zita Jones. There we go, the two Joneses. <laughs> but um, so forgive me if my uh, R's do roll at certain points, that's my accent kicking in. If I'm not making any sense, please ask me to slow down in the chat. I'll keep an eye on that because I do get into the stuff that I'm going to show you today, which is about presenting engagingly online. As Mary said, I've been involved in a lot of, I suppose, big and small events in my past as a speaker, but also as a producer. And in the last number of years now, being a speaker coach. And in the last couple of years, really also helping leaders present through this medium as well, because a lot of people, obviously has transitioned online using Zoom, Teams, so on and so forth, and they actually are really bad at it. I'm not going to judge anybody, but I'm just going to show you what is creatively possible with storytelling online, because there's so much more that you can do other than sharing your screen, which is the go-to I know most of us do, which is, okay, I have to present, I'll put together some content, I'll share my screen, I get reduced to a posted size stamp and hover in one of the corners or disappear completely, then I can read from my script because it's safe. Uh, and then the other people will 
get what I'm saying. And for the most people in the room, you're like doing your emails, you're answering Facebook stuff. You know, let's be honest, there's a lot more distractions than someone who's been reduced to a posted size stamp. And cognitively, the load on us to have attention when you're delivering online, it's much harder to retain it than in person. That's if you've ever read any of the research around Zoom fatigue. It's not around just being online for a long time. It's actually the cognitive load of being diminished to something really small, 2D and smaller still and boring presentations. That's the fatigue. So I'm going to show you some cool ways and show you what I've got set up here so that you can steal like an artist. I think Picasso once did uh, and literally show off when you're next presenting online. So the first thing I want to start with is what's changed. So historically, if you are invited to speak to an audience in inverted commas, it might have been this. Or if you're in some institutions, it might have been this. And more often than not, it's usually this, all right? So there's been a transition of mediums and uh, media in terms of how we produce uh, experiences and learning experiences as well. Because what was in person, you can see the white of their eyes, you can see them nodding has been reduced to maybe a speaker view. And if you're lucky, you can see some people's if they've got their, their cameras still turned on and see if they're attentive or not. So my point is that to create engagement online, you have to think about three things. And I recently mentioned this. I was luckily enough to not just produce TEDx events for the last 10 years. I was invited to speak at a TEDx event at the end of last year at TEDx Nelson. And I spoke about uh, the presenting lesson you never had. And that's what I want to kind of focus on is the three aspects of what makes a great presentation, because it doesn't matter if you're presenting in person or online. If you get these three things right, then you're going to create that engagement and participation and hopefully attention. I'm going to do this a couple of ways. So just again, to show the medium, I'm going to do kind of get my iPad. This is my normal iPad. Nothing to see here, you know, but I am literally just going to jump and show you kind of the three things that we can do. So the first thing. Uh, we're going to focus on, oh, sorry, we're just going to jump here. Cool, thank you, is Grace. So that should be coming up nice and pretty for you to see Grace. Grace is not what you're saying, it's how you are saying it. The second thing we're going to focus on is you, the resonance, the audience. What are the audience feeling from what you are saying? And the third thing, kind of obvious, is the stories you tell. But I call that credibility. Are you telling the right stories at the right time in the right way to give you credibility to be the one speaking, to have the emotional resonance, and you also delivering it in a way that's very graceful? So those are the three things that if you get all right. Now, apply this online. What is graceful delivery online? I want to start with what do you look like? So are you eye eye to the camera? Is it not shooting up your nose and giving you a double chin? You know, we've all done it, right? Uh, the light's quite nice. That makes you look quite attractive and pretty like I've got here. I've basically got one key light. You can see if I do that, that that's where my light is lighting me up. But I've also got some kick ass back light in, which I want to show you what I've done here because it's so cheap and so easy. If I reach over and pull this over, oh, I'll, I'll, do, I'll get the other one. That's going to fall off in a minute. There we go. This is what I've done. This is a pool noodle. You know, the things you float around in pools with? It's hollow. So if you get some LED lights that cost about 20 bucks to go under your cabinets, you put that through, you end up with a lightsaber. But basically, these are just lights that you can put in and around your background to make you look pop and pop out. So no, I'm just talking about what you look like online. It's kind of fun, right? When you get into this stuff. I'm also using a nice camera, which is up and away from me, and I can look at it. Most people look here. Or if they've got a setup, look there. If they've got a double setup, you know, screens and things. The camera is where you're supposed to be focusing your attention to because that's where the audience is, which is really tough if you're not media trained, right? It's hard to look at the camera constantly, especially if you want kind of waiting to see any engagement. Got a couple of cheap tricks to help you with that. Cut out a post, sorry, get a post-it note, big arrow, say, look here and put it in and around wherever your camera is. I know it's cheap. But it helps you to go, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be looking up at the camera. Well, the other one is get a picture of something that you really like, like a cat or a dog or a person, and cut out their eye and put that eye hole over the camera. And then you're constantly looking at the thing that you like. And then your attention is where it's supposed to be. So, again, I'm still just talking about the gracefulness. And I'm going to finish off the gracefulness because I could spend hours on this about sound, about quality, about lights, like I say, is about kind of the, the gestural cues and, and the positioning. A lot of people are much better when they stand up when they speak. 
especially if they want to give some energy and especially if you're talking about creativity and imagination and things we want to kind of imbue emotion when we're talking about those things it's not just an information thing it's an emotive thing most people do better when they stand up for that now i'm quite good i can be energetic because i'm just sat down and i can kind of have fun and wave my hands around but you don't not see in that but if you are standing up be careful if you're going from side to side if you're doing this because someone is watching you we've all got these physical cues that we're not aware of so that's the grace i'm just kind of running through now the the next one is the credibility and i want to kind of shift back to another thing that i can show you uh which is my favorite story model out there is you'll find it online called the nancy duarte shape of story and i'm going to actually shift shift to my iphone now i'm going to draw it for you there we go it's this. This is the best storytelling shape that you can do on here. So you're going to start down here, obviously, and this is your current state down here. And up here is your future state. And when you're presenting a story or anything, you're supposed to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And you're supposed to end up with a new bliss over here. That's the simplest storytelling model. Uh, most of the speakers that I coach, especially on the TEDx scenario, use that model. And it's so simple then to get across what you're trying to illustrate, which is the divide between what currently is happening in the world, but what you want to happen. Check out the Nancy Duarte shape of storytell stories, the shape of great stories. I think that's what it's called on, on TED. Uh, she describes it much better than I can. And she also deconstructs that model and applies it to Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, which we're all probably very aware of as a as a, a piece of oratory, it's amazing. And then also Steve Jobs, I have an iPhone launch speech in 2007, very polar opposites in terms of the reason to give a speech, but that applies. That model, which I just show, shared with you right there, applies to both those speeches, which you think can't be, but it can. So check out that. So that's the credibility. And the last thing I wanna to touch upon, because I appreciate we've only got 10, 15 minutes to provoke, and then there's gonna be lots of Q and A's, and I'm gonna show you some cool stuff that's going on, hopefully here, is uh, the resonance piece. A lot of people, when they present on, in any context, are quite nervous. By the way, you're supposed to feel nervous. I'm gonna get that out of the way. You might be very seasoned and a pro at it. I still get butterflies before I started. I was feeling all cool. Do I need to pee quickly? I don't really know. I feel that kind of rush of energy that I feel, which is always wonderful and delightful. You're supposed to feel that. But a couple of tricks to help you through that. One of the biggest problems of nerves is a physiological response, sweat, dry mouth, maybe shakes. You know, you all get those. I, I still get those sometimes. And one of my Jedi mind tricks is that you're not nervous. You're excited. You're not nervous. You're excited. Literally, it's like a, a little meme you can put in your brain. You're not nervous. You're excited. A little like quote you can carry with you. And the next time you come to present and you're feeling that physiological response of nerves, I want you to shift the narrative in your brain from nervous to excited. Because we've all been on roller coasters or gone to see our favorite sports team or artists perform. And before they're on stage or before that experience, you get the same physiological responses that of nerves, but it's excitement. It's in a different way. So all we're trying to do is change the track in your brain from you're not nervous to exciting. And that will give you a range of emotions because when you're nervous, you shut your face down. You might just smile all the way through a presentation because you're really nervous like this. But what you're saying is really serious and you come across like this. And the problem with that is you as a, an audience member get your emotional cues from me as the presenter. So I'm supposed to mirror the emotions you're supposed to feel in my presentation, which is another reason why you shouldn't share your screen. You should be as big as possible because you're supposed to carry the emotional resonance for the audience to feel. So again, I could spend a lot of time on that. But the last thing I would say, if you really do have problems with speaking in public or on public places, even online or in person, let's have a little kind of participation. We're going to reset your parasympathetic system. Big words for we're going to chill you the hell out. And I'm going to show you a little gift that I use. I got it on my phone and I walk up to people who are nervous and I show them this and I invite them to breathe in and out with this lovely expanding and contracting little visual. So obviously we can do that now, just breathe in, stop, not too quickly, and then out. And by the way, if you wanna yawn, that's fine. I usually yawn if I do this exercise because I'm slowing my breathing down and I feel chilled. 
So if you do this before any speech in any context, we're resetting your parasympathetic system and we're finding your resting breathing rate. I don't know if you know, but you have a resting breathing rate, just like your resting heart rate, which we've all done as kids, kind of timed it, 30 seconds, time two as you're resting uh, heart rate. You can actually do the same with your resting breathing rate. Stick your hand on your diaphragm, have a breathe, have a, just breathe normally when you're next relaxed and find your resting breathing rate. And then when it comes to your next presentation, do exactly the same five minutes before you present. Find your breathing rate. Now you know your resting breathing rate. I guarantee it's not anywhere close to the, what it should be. And breathing is something you can control. So now you can slow it down to your resting breathing rate and find that beautiful physiological calm before you start opening your mouth to present. So again, I'm going to wrap up there because I'm hoping you've got lots of questions about my setup, how I actually did the Jedi mind trick, cool stuff here and made you made me look really awesome. And I can walk you through everything. All the questions, please throw them, throw them at my face. Thank you. OK, so we we're really good at this group in the bottom of our screen. We have a raise hand feature that we're really good at deploying. We also raise our hand and can wave sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes I figure out how to do the lower hand, like how to put the hands down. That's some, I get good at that one too. Um, all right, this is fantastic, DK, thank you. And uh, obviously you're, you're an, an example of the work that you do because of all of the clarity and the fun and the grace that you're bringing to, to us tonight. So does anyone have a, a question or want some insight <laughs> into uh, how to, how to do some of these these great things or about DK's work in general. Michael. Um, thanks, Alexis. Um, DK, um, you come across at the moment as being very relaxed and very um, easy with what you're doing. So was there a time when you didn't feel that way at all that, you know, at an age when you, the idea of coming out to do something like this or going out on stage or, or going out to do a presentation of any kind would have been very difficult for you. Or have you always been a bit of a ham? Have you always wanted to go out on a stage and, 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 and tell jokes or make a presentation? How long, how long has this been going on? <laughs> Thank you, Michael. That's the, that's the perfect question. Uh, the former. So I was never good at this and I never thought I'd be good at this. So if I tell you kind of my origin story uh, and I'll also help that with a little video. So this is me growing up. Um, so I'm, I don't know how old I am, a toddler. Growing up in the valleys of South Wales, I'm a runt of the litter. I got three, uh, two older brothers. This is my auntie Julian. Not a lot of people can pull off that combo set. Look at that. Look at that fashion right there. So I was born um, in the valleys of South Wales and it was early picked up that I got a hearing impairment. And what that means when you're younger is speech therapy for some people, because if you can't hear properly, then you can't then pronounce words properly because you're not hearing the sounds. So early on, uh, uh, kind of from a time from since I could remember really till the time I was about seven or eight, I went to speech therapy every week with my mum to both learn how to listen. And then when I could hear certain sounds or at least identify certain sounds, I then have to learn how to pronounce them with my mouth. So as a hearing impaired person, uh, I've got a really low kind of um, low kind of esteem growing up of hearing my own voice because I always thought I would mumble a lot and couldn't enunciate very well because I couldn't hear properly. So I had all those barriers to entry to then be an auditor in any uh, right. And then my early career, I, I started in local government in youth work and was in local authority work, and which meant I had to present papers to full board meetings. I hated every minute of that, standing up, speaking not only to public, but also to the elected officials, you know, just, and I, oh, no, please don't, just hurt me, just take me away, put me in a room, hold me, rock me, I don't want to do this. Uh, and then when I first started working with young people in youth clubs, that was my first time I felt I needed to have a voice to have agency and help them as well. So I did a lot of video projects, a lot of art and, and kind of magazine work with young people pre-internet. Um, so that was really when I, I suddenly had to hold court and 
could then not worry about people taking the piss out of my accent or taking the piss out of that I couldn't get the words quite right. And you might notice I'll stop every now and again. And what I'm doing there is to thinking about the word I'm going to say to pronounce it in my mouth. It's not that I can't think of the word. I've got the word. I've just got to remember where my tongue needs to go in my speech therapy times, which is kind of fun to still have in my kind of lexicon of how I deliver. And then about 20 years, no, not even that, 2006, I started a, my first company all to do with emerging technologies uh, back when blogging was cool and podcasting wasn't anywhere. And I've been podcasting since 2006. And I then got invited to speak in public and got paid for it and thought I'm going to have to get good at this. So I stole like an artist, like I said, from Picasso uh, and looked at what other people are doing well, how they hold court. I asked a lot of questions. And one of the things I do with my, my speaker coaching when I help clients is Public speaking, you cannot practice, which goes to the opposite of most learned wisdom out there when it comes to giving a talk in anything. We got to practice, practice, practice. I'm like, no, 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 because you can't practice the conditions for speaking in public. No, you can prepare. Ha, huh? now that's different. But once you start practicing with a script in your house in front of your cat, your neighbor, your, your loved ones, and they're all going great, that's lovely, you know, fantastic. And then you're stood on a stage in front of a class or your peers or online in front of 50 educators across the world, maybe those conditions aren't practiced. And therefore, you don't deliver like you practiced for. You have to have the conditions, right? So I think public speaking or storytelling in this guise is an exposure skill. And you have to have a lot of self-reflection, a lot of kind people around you to nudge you in the right direction to say you're speaking too fast, breathe. Just calm down your accent, which I go against because I, I want to be who I am, my authentic self. A lot of people have said, you got to get rid of your accent. I'm like, nah, this is me, dude. Uh, and just as uh, Dwayne was kind of advocating for standing in your truth and your, your own voice, it's the same for each and every one of us. Now, there's certain nuances I had to get around. I used to use a lot of diffluencies, which are very, very big words for small words. Diffluencies mean ums, ers, likes, you knows, all those filler words that we add in when we're a little bit nervous when we're presenting. I don't know if you notice, I don't have any. And it feels like I'm practiced. I'm not. I've learned to slow down when I'm hearing an um or an R or no coming up. And I fill that with a little bit of a pause and a gap because I've been exposed enough in these situations that I conditioned myself to know and be take, take awareness of those different things. So that's a very long answer to a simple statement of no, I wasn't good at this. I had to learn it just like anybody else. And I think there's only 20, 15% of people out there who are natural born kind of not just storytellers, but orators. Now those are two different things, by the way. I know a lot of great storytellers who fall over the second you put them in some kind of public speaking scenario. But I also know great public speakers who are really bad storytellers. And usually they're pale, male and stale and they hold the positions of authority and they get up just for five minutes to do a little bit of a, a wrap up or an opener and 15 minutes later, they're still talking and no one knows what their point is because they're very comfortable up there and they're just rambling and they're not taking awareness of, of the resonance in the audience group and they're not understanding that if you tell a story, you're supposed to have a point. So that's kind of where I think I'll finish there because. You can tell I can ramble. I got lots of stories. Thank you for your question. Fantastic. Thanks, DK. Uh, we've got John, Lindsay, Jackie, and Fred. You, I saw yours in the chat, and I'll come back to you to see if you want to ask it in person. All right, John, take it away. I did see Lindsay's hand raised before mine, but if Lindsay's okay, I will go. <laughs> yeah, sure. Go ahead. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, gosh, I'm. Where are we? Um, I, yes, you can hear me. Okay, I was just want to make sure my my mic was on there. Um, DK, I, I'm really struck by seeing the word grace uh, presented as uh, as an important word in in a, in a presentation. I recently co-edited a book that we wanted to call "Gifts, Grace, and Gratitude," um, but the uh, publisher didn't want to use that because it's, you know, grace doesn't really work on a search engine. Um, so, uh, but we, when we wrote the, um, the introduction, <clears throat> the introduction, we made sure that we included gifts, grace and gratitude in the introduction. Could you tell me a little bit more about why grace uh, is such an important, uh, that was the first word you put up there. Uh, why is grace such an important um, 
ingredient, if I can use that word, um, mm -hmm. of, um, of presence. Thank you for the question because, and for noticing the word and it's, I suppose, seniority in how I shared it. I've got a bias towards grace as a thing that I focus on because a number of reasons. I think it's the easiest thing to get your head around and to fix. And it has the maximum impact of when you present it. Now I'm biased because I, I've, I've worked with a lot of leaders who probably have a lot of credibility already just by their title and the stories and by virtue of who they are, right? And they might also have a lot of resonance because I know the stories they tell are quite cool. But the gracefulness is something that not a lot of people even start to consider, consider when presenting. And online grace is a really important thing, like the, the lights and everything else. It's not, remember, it's not what you're saying, it's how you are saying it, but that's everything to do with your physicality, your surroundings, what you wear, uh, how you move your head, your hands, your feet and stuff like that. And in the TEDx talk I gave, I, I show, and I, I'm unapologetic, although I do glibly say, I'm sorry, not sorry, then I'm going to show you things that you can't unsee once I show you, because you're going to see them in a lot of people, which illustrate to me that there's a deficit in their either confidence or understanding of the topic matter and stuff like that. And these could simply thing be like the one-legged walking. So physically, when you're presenting in person, one-legged walking is when someone's standing and they're moving one leg back and forth like they're really kind of nervous like one leg wants to leave the other leg's not letting it and it kind of, that's what's happening in, literally in their body or you get the hip hops which kind of people move back and forth back and forth back and forth right and that's fine by the way that people do that it only becomes an issue if it becomes distracting if it becomes the obvious tell that you're nervous like moving is not a problem they're just trickle cues if it comes up and happens often and every point you make is waved in like this or it's reductive like you know donald trump does he kind of reduces you down he kind of hold you someone had a word with him and he stopped doing that now he just holds on to the lectern very interesting versus someone like obama who has a physical presence which is just so relaxed and in himself right you can see grace in so many modalities. And I'll share with you one story I, I, um, I experienced because it was a failing of mine. We, have, we coach all our TEDx Wellington speakers through a five-week program. Before we ask them to present, there's a five-week coaching experience that they all go through. And I think it was 2017, 16, something like that. We had someone who was presenting and her topic was funerals and how to design funerals. And her experience as a funeral director slash designer and some of the stories that she was sharing were quite emotive, so we say, you know, and we knew it would be triggering for the audience. Now, these five week, every week, they get up and give their presentation because we're exposing them to hearing their stories out loud, exposing them to an audience every week. They do that. So they get conditioned, remember, not practiced, prepared in terms of what they're doing. By week three, this lady had changed her talk every week and she just didn't look comfortable. And remember, we're teaching because to stand on that little red carpet, to stand and deliver with that gracefulness, that confidence and things. And she just didn't look comfortable in everything she said and every week. So I had to have a conversation with her saying, is there anything going on in your life? What, you know, and she was like, I'm just not getting it. And I'm like, well, what don't you get? I just don't feel comfortable speaking like this and, and telling these stories. And I'm like, you signed up to TEDx. This is what TEDx is all about, sharing your stories, ideas worth spreading. So I'm just not comfortable. And I was like, huh, what makes you comfortable? She went, well, I just don't feel authentic up there. The best authentic space I find myself in, and I know it's going to sound weird, is when clients come to me, when I first meet them, they're usually on the sharp end of emotion because they just lost a loved one. And they want to get straight into the details of funeral um, design and development. And I quieten them down. I sit them on a nice sofa and I sit on the other sofa. There's nothing in between us. And we chat about the person they just lost, not the funeral, the person. And, it's, and she said, that's my best version of me. And we were like, we've been failing this person from a grace perspective. We've been asking it to stand and deliver and with aplomb. So, what we did was find a really comfy seat. We sat her down and the talk became intimate. It became soft, not in a soft, but soft, just as a gentle. And it came very arresting. 
Now that's a great side of something that people probably wouldn't have considered. But like I said, we were failing her up until that point because we thought we had a way of delivery. So the way I always approach my coaching is it's not what you should do. This is what you could do, but I need to know more about you and to understand what can amplify um, the best for you in terms of the gracefulness. So that's why grace is important to me because we just changed that one thing in her and boom, everything just fitted. It was brilliant. Thank you. John. Wow. Thanks, DK. Uh, Lindsay, it is now your turn. And then it'll be Jackie's turn. Uh, great. Thanks. Um... So I've, I mean, I've got a few technical questions because uh, for one, I, I like you don't have that cutout look. Um, so you're not, you're not, you, do you have an actual screen behind you? Like a, like a white so, thing with the light on it? How do, so this is a wall, a wall. This is the corner of my spare bedroom. Wow. Okay. That's. Uh, as an artist, we don't have any blank wall space left in our house. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Mm -hmm. um, the other question was, uh, yeah, because I do find that f fake screen um, very distracting, and and um, and you you don't have that happening, so that's cool. Uh, well, how did you use the iPad and stuff? That mm. I love. And the and I mean I get the having a second camera, but I've only done it as signing that camera in as another participant. So I don't know what you're yeah. doing. I'm really interested. So I'm happy to share everything. And just before I do that, I want to celebrate your kind of openness because I'm not a big fan of the cutout stuff. And I think it just comes down to taste. It's nothing, no one's doing anything wrong there. It's just, I think we as visual creatures, probably you and I and other people in the room, we notice these things, right? And and therefore that's the reason I have nothing is because I don't want people to notice anything but me. It's all about me. So yeah, that's kind of why I have approached it and designed it this way. However, you asked a question about my technical setup and I'm gonna walk you through it. I'm using two things and I'm gonna write them down here. Uh, the first one is a, a piece of software called OBS. It's actually short for Open Broadcasting System. OB, oh, I've just emailed the wrong, sorry, CNC. I've just, everyone, uh, OBS. I'm sure someone can find it on the Googles very quickly and drop in a link. Open Broadcasting System is a piece of open software open source, we big fan of open source here, so, and it works on any platform in terms of Linux, uh, Windows, as well as Macs. I'm on a Mac for your brain, but it works on everything and it works the same. And that piece of software sits between my browser for Zoom, let's just say, and my the rest of the tech that I've got. And I've set up scenes in that software so that I can then jump to, which you saw when I pulled up like images or change to the setup that I have, right? So how I then jump, to the different scenes and what I've set up. I use then a piece of hardware, which is a, a, a Elgato Stream Deck. There we go. That's what it's called. Brilliant. So the Elgato, and I literally will hold it up so you can see it. If I just grab, I've got to be careful with the cables as per everything. I wish they do a Bluetooth version of this. Although I know you can get the app, but I haven't done the app yet. So this is my Elgato Stream Deck. And on it, it's literally buttons that I have programmed on the different scenes in OBS. So when I press this button, you will disappear. And I go to my slides, inverted commas, or I can go to my iPad, is my iPad button. And you can kind of go back and forth between my iPad. Now from muscle memory, I keep this down there and I could just press it very quickly without really looking at it and just jump around, cool, right? But I can also do cool stuff in OBS because say you did have some slides that you really had to present upon. And I, I appreciate some people need visuals. They want to kind of show. Um, so here's how I would do it. I would split screen it. Yeah. And I would show slides like that. And then you don't lose me kind of talking about this stuff. Sorry, this stuff. i got to get that right. <laughs> this stuff, um, which is kind of cool, right? Uh, and all I've done here is just set that up in OBS. Or I could do newsreader style. Newsreader style. Welcome to newsreader stuff and stuff over there now. So there we go. So, so th this is kind of just all different scenes set up in OBS. And it just takes a little bit of clicking around. There's so many YouTube tutorials online uh, that you can play around with. And once it's then set up, you can literally then play with the size. You could probably see this in real time, me playing with 
my OBS. So where do I put this? You know, it's going to be up there, right? So I can move to the left and I'm boom, but I want to make this a little bit bigger. So when I come to that, it's kind of there. Now, again, it does come down to what story you tell in and does the medium and the way in which I just showed you lend itself and amplify that. Technology for me is an augmentation system. It's not a replication or it shouldn't replace something. It should augment, it should amplify. You should be able to do, and it's the same thing with the iPad and my iPhone. I've got my iPhone just set up here. I'm using my iPhone plugged in. And when I jump to my iPhone, I can then draw because maybe you're a good drawer, you know, and an illustrator and you want to show in real time. But the important thing, you're not losing me there. And you have, I'm having fun and still talking and you see both kind of the experience. That's how I'm doing all that. It's kind of fun, right? I wow. love it. You don't, I feel like I don't need a like to have a tech degree to understand it. <laughs> you don't. You do need a little bit of time, definitely. You need mm -hmm. a bit of creativity. But what I love about most of these things that I showed you, you know, the Stream Deck does cost. That's that's like 250 bucks. You know, it's an investment. Um, I got the mid saying you can get bigger ones, you can get smaller ones, which are cheaper, by the way, with less buttons on. Up to you how you roll. You can even get foot pedals now. So you can use foot pedals to change things. Yeah. The hardware sets that help you do what you do online is fantastic. Wow. And the other big investment I would say is I've invested in a good camera because the fidelity of these experiences is really important to connect from a resonance perspective, as I said earlier. Because if I'm grainy and I've blocked up my background and I'm not that good looking and the, the light's too heavy on me or my light's not even there, like that would be kind of awful, right? Kind of you got to figure this stuff out to make you look the best you can be so that then the audience experience is getting the best that you have. So that is my uh, Sony A6100 camera. I'll just write that down in here. It's only a six, uh, or is it 200? I think it's only a six, only six, 100, uh, six, 100. And the reason I'm, I'm, I'm quoting that is because that's what a lot of Twitchers use. Uh, people who use Twitch, Twitch is a platform where you can watch other people playing video games and people can make livings on Twitch and some other things. And these are just workhorses. They plug in, they're USB powered, they mount like an external webcam and they don't overheat. So you can stream for like six, seven, eight, nine hours uh, and away you go. I obviously don't do it for that long, but the fidelity of this experience is just a little small Sony camera. I again, I'm done anything sexy with a camera. There's no, it comes with a kit lens, and boom. Now the fidelity is really good. And the last thing I will say about my setup is my my little mic that I have mounted here. It's my little mic. There we go. It's a Sony A6100. Sorry, no, it's, that's my camera. This is an AT2020. I'll put that in Audio Technica 2020. Um, this is a workhorse. I bought this. 12 years ago, and I am at the replace it. It's a piece of engineering delight. Uh, and it's a br brilliant fidelity in terms of audio now, because one thing I would say about audio versus video, if you had to invest in one, invest in audio. I know that sounds weird presenting online, because people will put up with bad video if they got great sound, but they won't put up with good video if you got bad sound. It just doesn't work the other way around for some reason. So if you have to invest in something, go for the audio um, and figure out where to put the pillows and to cut out any bouncing. I haven't because this is a great condenser mic. So it uh, um, captures exactly what I wanted to capture. Fantastic. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you for your patience waiting. No, it's riveting. Thank you. Um, DK, I just want to know um, what are some of your suggestions if there is a technical breakdown that occurs and how do you mm. stay composed, um, you know, through that process of getting something back online or, 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 or still engage folks in, in some particular way, just curious of what your thoughts are on that. Brilliant. Really appreciate this question because probably people were thinking it and they weren't as brave as enough as you to ask it. So thank you for that. Yeah. What happens when shit falls over, right? So I used to have a slide, I don't have it anymore, which is like technical difficulties will be right back. <laughs> so you can literally just jump to the slide that says that if anything falls over from your end. And then the, the people online will know that, oh, they're sorting something out. So as an admin person or a person running events, uh, I also MC some events online. I make sure my producer has one of those slides to hand because things can fall over and I want to just to jump there. So if you're working at a higher higher end, make sure you're in touch with the producer and things like that. But if it's just you presenting and some things go wrong, 
depending on what it is, is how I would respond. So sound again, if it cuts out, I people won't be forgiving. They'll be telling you in the chat, I can't hear you, right? Or I can't see certain things. So I would utilize the chat and keep an eye on the chat. One of the things on, when you present online, you can't really get away with not keeping an eye on things. Whereas when you're on stage, you kind of can see everything. When you present online, you got to get every now and again glance down and make sure that you're still there, you're still streaming. You know, you can see it's kind of working. And in the chat, no one's going, dude, you're gone. You know, so keep an eye on that thing. If you do disappear, it's just fall on your sword time. It's like, sorry about that. It might be your issue. It shouldn't. One of the good things that I've found over the last couple of years is get yourself a hardwired ADSL lines. In other words, plug into the back of your router a proper line that comes into your computer, however that works for you. I got it through an, a USB 3 and stuff like that. That's how I do it. It might be different depending on what computer. The reason to hardwire your system is because Wi-Fi can get flaky, especially if you've got other things going on in your home. If you're hardwired in, then the only thing that's going to stop you from presenting good online are two things. Either your computer mucks up or the internet provider mucks up. And hopefully, before you started, you would have shut down the applications you're not using. So that boosts your processing power of your computer. And also make sure that nothing's getting away. All your notifications are turned off. Because we've been to many presentations, haven't we, where we're constantly hearing, ding. And you're like, what the hell is that? And the person who's presenting still have their notifications on, which every email drops in. It's like, turn your email off. Don't want to hear your notifications. So again, consider the kind of credibility that you're losing when people are hearing that. Think, think about the resonance that you're losing. Uh, but when things go wrong, just admit it. Uh, when I'm, uh, the, my favorite kind of story is when I was uh, presenting, I, I had a slide once, which I totally forgot why I had that slide. And I looked at it and I, I went blank and it was in front of about 800 people. And I looked at it for a second. I'm saying, well, nobody else knows but me, you know, that that slide there. But I'm like, but I need to come up with something quick. And I was like struggling in my brain. And I just for a second, I thought I'm going to let them in. And I just told them, I said, I have no idea why this slide is here. And it was uncomfortable for a second. I started laughing. They started laughing because they could see that, oh, he's serious. You know, this is not a thing. It's like, and I'm like looking at it going, anybody? Anybody? God, why is that there? If I remember, I'll come back. And I just then moved on, right? I really think that people are forgiven enough. If you make a mistake, if anything goes wrong, if you call it out, people will be along with you. And if you laugh at it, it's like you can have fun. You know, turn it into a positive is my point. Holy cow. This is this is like what an evening. <laughs> I mean, I'm in, my spirit's getting stretched in two different directions tonight. This is great. Um, if uh, we have a couple more questions or anything from anyone, Fred, did you want to ask about your camera? But you seem to maybe have got your answer. Well, um while you're saying that, I'm actually seeing three of you because you're right in the corner of three things. And I thought, hmm, we could play with that. I wonder what lights you would do there to get those mm -hmm. all up around you. But it's a good spot. Um, it was the uh, sense of credibility. And we know that humor is a powerful tool. It mm -hmm. creates resonance. It uh, creates identity. It moves people's emotions. But some people are not good at it. And how do the two things of using a powerful tool like that versus credibility, how would you uh, advise people? I'd advise them carefully. And I say that because some of my clients, uh, I don't get a lot of time with them. I might have just met them. I've only got them for 90 minutes and I'm coaching them because they're off to do something else and they're very senior and that's it. And I don't know their personality. So when they try humor, I don't know if that's just failing there or actually it's just the way they are. I might not get their humor. Humor is a tough one to advise upon is my point here. And I'm really careful when it comes to, oh, I think you need to add more laughs into this presentation. I never say that because I don't know if they can deliver that. But I will do the opposite if people is being too humorous and the topic is quite hard hitting. And this comes down to the resonance piece. And I'll draw this out for you if you don't mind jumping back to my iPad. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh -huh. There we go. Jump over to this layer. Um, turn that one off. There we go. So the way I think about emotion in designing uh, presentations, and this could come into your human question, is literally a linear line, just a, a, a simple line. And on here, you've got the negative emotions, the fear, the despair, the terribleness. And on the other end is obviously the opposite of that, the hope, the, the delight that you can give people in storytelling. Now, the worst place you can be is in here, right? And I call this the meh zone. Just get a response. When you hear something, you just go meh. Okay, it's just information. I'm not saying the information is not cool, but it's how you then share that information. Now, the fun thing is if you can go back and forth. For example, if you're given a presentation on climate change, you obviously might want to start here, maybe. But you might also want to start here, which is to give people pathways and hopes because they've heard too much of the other. But you can't leave the, the two ends of the spectrums out. The worst you can be is, like I say, in the middle. Now, humor then is more kind of this end, unless you're culturally attuned to irony, uh, where you can be in the more dark black end of humor. And then that comes up with another question of culturally, what are the stories you share in, in what cultural context are you sharing them? Because I've presented on five continents and I've said things in different countries which have got raucous laughs and I've said them somewhere else exactly the same way. And I've got like, huh, cool, like a head nod, kind of, yeah, I get that, cool. You know? I'm like, huh, why is that? And it's a cultural thing. And humor is one of those things that you've got to be very careful of culturally. And especially if the references of the humors are related to the culture that you're in at the moment. Obviously, a Western, you know, American cultural identity is very different if you're then presented in Germany. It might have some similar references. There might some nuances to travel across if you're doing pop culture references and you're re referencing The Last of Us. And OK, it's been there as well. So I can kind of reference that. But does everybody in the audience know what I mean by that? So hum human is good, should be used in storytelling like human is in cooking sparingly. I'll stop there. That's great. It looks like we have a question in the chat from Kathy. When the video is slow, like for DK now, is that coming from the presenter or on the end of the receiver? Just wondering, as the sound and mm -hmm. video have not been matching up some time. Cool. Could be both, uh, Kathy. So the only way to know that is if you've got other people telling you, no, it's fine for me. And then we deconstruct. So I'll ask if everybody else, is the audio and the video matching up for you? Yes or no? Thumbs up or thumbs down? He was fine for me, Fred. Thank you. Might be the receiver, Kathy. That's the only way to find out, Kathy, is to do a litmus test against other people who are online. Now, it could be then if everybody's saying, actually, yeah, we're all getting the same thing. My fault. Maybe I don't have it plugged in hardwired. Maybe the Wi-Fi is lagging because there's five people in the house and they're all on it. So it's like, you know, it's trying to push through and the fidelity is not working and the bandwidth is not there for it. So you're going to have to double check on both both ends of the spectrum. It, it might be you. It might be me. You know, classic thing. Right. So thank you for the question. Though. Great. Jackie. Um, yes, DK is just a question around sometimes. Um, in a presentation, you may have delivered the information you need to deliver um, and you have some quite, the engagement is not where you would like it to be. So you ask questions, but there's no feedback or there's a level mm. of discomfort or there's a, a level of people are sitting with new information in ways that they're not yet, they have not yet processed. Are there any tips to to shift the energy, the space, to engage folks in that context? Yeah, thank you. So we're talking about engagement now and, and understanding about the information imparted you already know might be have an emotional context to it, might uh, react accordingly, but also it might dampen the whole feeling in the room, the virtual room or the physical room, right? So yes, there's different ways about thinking about participation and feedback mechanisms. Online, because we're online, let's just focus on that first. There's a couple of things that you can do as a presenter pre-presenting. Um, so you're pre, peri and post, right? So pre is before, peri is during, post after. So 
you can design engagement all the way across that thing. So pre it, you can ask everybody to turn up with a, a, a couple of A4 pieces of paper and a really thick pen. You can't use a biro. So straight away, you're priming them to arrive to participate. And the first thing you start with is you've all got your pens and pieces of paper. I want you to write in an emotive fashion, emoji, emojis, how are you feeling today? And hold it up to the camera. And I'm going to take a photo. Boom, right. My job today is to shift that frown to a smile or whatever. Or you can do on a scale of one to 10 uh, on this topic that I'm about to present in. What is your competency? Or how do you feel about it, right? You can come up with these questions. And straight away, you, you get in a barometer of emotion from the audience before you even share information, before you start the story. So that's pre. During the story or during the presentation, especially like you've just said, you, you, you have an emotional literacy here that's showing me that you, you want to you wanna help the audience to both engage, but also reflect. You also know that you're going to be challenging, but you don't want to do it in a way which triggers people. So I'm hearing from you, you've got a sensitivity around that thing, which is great. So I would build a presentation if you know it's going to be arresting and triggering around chapters. Are we creating space to breathe, literal breathe? Are we creating space to reflect, to have the emotional context explored a little bit? Because there's a great quote by George Bernard Shaw, which is the illusion of communication is often it's been achieved. And the, as a presenter, we fall into that gap, uh, uh, that kind of uh, trick a lot is that, oh, I shared my information. Why aren't they reacting accordingly? I've done my job. And it's like, well, that's half the job. You shared information, but the illusion has been achieved. Is it still up to you to ask them? So the three chapters in your presentation now, instead of one big one and then ask for engagement, you're going to break it up and you're going to ask them as you go for, does that make sense? Anybody triggered by that? Is there anything that you need me to humanize through the information I just shared? Because it might be high level and you need to humanize it a little bit. So that's Perry, and then post it, obviously, at the end, you can then break down into groups, you can do quizzes, you can do anonymous engagement stuff, which is sometimes as good as the scene stuff, in other words, holding things. So you might want to create a little link, a Slideo thing, which you, hey, I'm going to drop a link in, it's anonymous, tell us where you are on this topic, yeah, post it, uh, did I do a good job, you know, stuff like that, and people can then participate, but anonymously. You got all these tools at your hand, uh, but I love that you're already thinking this way about sometimes I present the engagement, but it's also challenging and I want to make sure my sensitivity is matching what I'm putting out into the world. So hopefully I've given you some ideas, Jackie, there. Thank you. And yet again, somehow the night slips away from us um, and we're heading into our last few minutes. Um, any last thoughts from anyone? at all before we uh, say a huge thank you to DK. Mary, do you have any last thing? Oh, Fred, and then maybe I'll hand it over to Mary to wrap up. Uh, just weaving together some of the ideas from tonight about tech problems. It's never if they occur, but when they occur. Uh, and, and the humor, I was uh, asked to put together uh, slides and work the tech for a wedding. And instead, we switched it in the last week to do the funeral for her father. And they wanted a song. I prepared it, tested it. It was perfect. In the middle, because I didn't own the song, I was using a YouTube. In the middle, YouTube threw in an ad of a guy sitting on a toilet and flushing right in the middle of the funeral. And I was, yeah, thank you, Jackie, because I'm sitting there in fear and the room fell apart. Because it was his humor. <laughs> it was so perfect. I thought, can ghosts work the technology? I wondered, but you know, sometimes you just have to roll with it and go with it. Of course, I did buy YouTube Premium afterwards to make sure I didn't get ads, but <laughs> just, just, uh, story. yeah, keeping it light. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, it's been a wonderful session. Thank you so much, DK. I think uh, you've given us a lot to think about <laughs> and to think about how we can apply that to the, to the world that we're in <clears throat> because we're all presenting so much online now. And how do we do that more effectively? And I think, <clears throat> sorry, um, I think the whole idea of being authentic and, and coming across um, 
you know, who we are, like to be able to really express who we are. And, uh, and that is sometimes admitting that there's a mistake or laughing at something we've done or um, being part of the audience and, and, you know, and th that idea of kind of relaxing into it and, and being authentic in terms of our feelings and what we're expressing, even if we are working online. So um, mm. I think, I think I've, it's been really wonderful and gained a lot of insights and I hope everyone else feels the same. And, and thank you so much for joining us from such a far away place. So um, a round of applause for your uh, contribution this evening. We're so glad you were able to join us. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to have voice and sharing some cool stuff. Uh, hopefully I get to meet some of you. I'm actually in North America in July. So reach out if you want to connect. I don't know when I'm going yet, but I know I'm going back to the UK because it's my grand's 100th birthday. So I want to go and give her a cuddle, as we say in Wales, kutch. Um, so yeah, I got to go back in June for that. And then I'm back via North America before I come back to New Zealand. So reach out, have a chat. Take Fantastic. Care. Thank so you, much. DK, on behalf of the Canadian Network for Imagination and Creativity. This is our network and our network is now reaching it all the way to New Zealand and for the World Creativity and Innovation Week and Day. Uh, we're so pleased to be presenting this as part of the WCIW Canada event. So thank you, uh, DK, and uh, we'll talk to everyone very soon. We'll be back in May with our next Idea Jam. We've got some good stuff cooking. Ming Yu is coming back again with a guest and we'll be deep diving a bit more into improvisation. So we will see you all back in May. Great.